Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on Motion 14836 in the name of Gillian Martin on Climate Change Emissions Reduction Targets Scotland Bill at Stage 1. I would invite those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Gillian Martin, Minister, to speak to and to move the motion. Around nine minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to open today's Stage 1 debate and set out the Government's reason for bringing forward the Climate Change and Missions Reduction Target Scotland Bill. We have moved at pace on this legislation, so I thank colleagues from across the Chamber who have engaged with me in recent weeks to understand our approach and help me make the progress that we need. I also want to thank the Net Zero and the Delegated Powers Committee for their scrutiny of the Bill to this point and for their support for the general principles of the Bill. Presiding Officer, in the Climate Change Emissions Reductions Target Scotland Act 2019, this Parliament set highly ambitious emissions targets, including a reduction of 75% by 2030. At that time, the independent experts at the Climate Change Committee advised us all that the target was beyond their recommendation and would require extraordinary effort to achieve. We all regret that it has not been possible to find a policy pathway to meet this target and that in March the Climate Change Committee advised us that the 2030 target was beyond what can be achieved. The urgency of this legislation is driven by their expert advice. Maintaining our current targets would leave us in the unsustainable position where we have targets that we know we cannot meet and are therefore unable to bring forward a credible climate change plan which can meet our targets. I will. It's just a brief intervention, but while there were ambitious targets, were there not uh, suggestions from the Climate Change Committee on how we could meet those targets? Uh, Cabinet Secretary? Yeah, of course, there were many, many suggestions from the Climate Change uh, Committee on how we could meet these targets. And one of them I re remember very clearly because it had a, a bearing on, on, on the area that I represent, in that they said that uh, uh, carbon, capture uh, carbon capture utilisation and storage was a fundamental uh, action that would have to ha happen in order for our climate change mm -hmm. targets to be met. And I, it, it's a great regret to me that they have not had track, track status given to the ACORN project in the Scottish cluster, mm -hmm. because that would have meant that we would have probably been further along the line than, than, than we are right now. Um, presiding officer, uh, I'll, make some, I'll make some headway, and I'll, I'll take Mr Lumsden uh, at, one, at one point. Presiding officer, for those who would argue that we could make it to 75 per cent reductions by 2030, I must strongly state that the scale, range and pace of action would be unjust, unrealistic and could damage households and our communities in many ways. We must therefore have the courage to accept that although our ambition was laudable, these targets are unrealistic and we, may, we must find a better way forward that enables us to meet net zero by 2045 and one that takes the whole of Scotland with us. We all share that ambition, which I know has led to a real change in the way that climate action is viewed across government, local government and in wider society. This government is also clear that we must reach a just and fair net zero and that doing so involves taking a different path the path set out in today's bill. We have learned a great deal since 2019, the 2019 Act about how our target system operates and how it might work better. This bill addresses this learning and moves us from linear annual targets to a system of five-year carbon budgets, and this is a major and much needed change in approach. The system introduced through this bill will set a limit of the amount of greenhouse gases emitted in Scotland over a five-year period. The expert advice of the Climate Change Committee is that these carbon budgets better reflect Scotland's long-term decarbonisation journey and smooth out the volatility of annual emissions. In contrast, the rigid system of annual target systems struggles to account for in-year fluctuations like harsher winters, an unexpected global crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've also been learning the use of carbon budgets in Wales and Northern Ireland as well as further afield. The, this bill will now allow those targets to be set by regulations after we receive the Climate Change Committee advice on levels and it will align our climate change plan timeline with the new system. And I'm glad that the Net Zero Committee agrees that our new targets framework offers a better and more flexible system for the emissions reductions targets than the current approach. These budgets, based on the advice of experts, represent our best path towards Net Zero. And as the Chamber is aware, the CCC advice is next expected in spring next year. 
From there, we will finalise and publish our draft climate change plan, and I have committed to try and do that by the summer recess if the advice from the CCC is received at the right time. If it does not, I can assure members that we will publish it as soon as possible, even if that ends up being in recess. I would also like to inform members that when the CCC advice is received, I will host a round table for my counterparts across all parties in this Parliament to hear your views directly. It is essential that we work together on behalf of Scotland to decide on the action that we need to take to reach any targets that the Parliament sets. This Bill's provisions are strictly limited to those necessary to bring forward carbon budget framework and enable the next climate change plan to reflect our carbon budgets. We remain steadfast in our statutory goal of net zero by 2045 and to our statutory requirements on annual reporting on emissions and progress. To be clear, Presiding Officer, while we move from annual targets to five-year carbon budgets, we will maintain an annual reporting cycle, and this will include updates on our emissions levels and review the progress of our climate change plan, including developments in each sector of the plan. At the end of each carbon budget period, these reports will state whether Scotland's carbon budget target for that period has been met. In addition, I can assure colleagues that the existing statutory duties relating to the climate change plan including the costing of policies, will remain under this bill and we will continue the approach of not allowing carryover between targets. Presiding officer, we can see from our recent UK leading achievements in afforestation and provision of electric charging points, which are the highest outside of London, that Scotland continues to lead the way in the journey to net zero. Under this government, taking resolute action on net zero will not change. Carbon budgets will reinforce our momentum with an underpinning of credible targets. They will support government and our many partners in Scotland's decarbonisation journey in achieving our continued aims and actions. Scotland continues to be at the forefront of climate action and I truly believe that the people of Scotland share a drive to net zero ambitions and to protect future generations. We have already achieved great st uh, strides in decarbonisation from the rise of renewables in our energy sector. Uh, renewable energy capacity has grown from 6.7 gigawatts in 2013 to 15.6 gigawatts in 2024 <clears throat> to the provision of concessionary uh, bus travel benefiting, benefiting nearly half the population and in carbon sequestration through peatland restoration and tree planting thing, but a few. But we need to go a lot further and we do know that. The next steps will not be easy and there are difficult choices that we must address collectively. But let us not forget that thanks to the progress we have already made, Scotland is already halfway to net zero and continues to be ahead of the UK in delivering long-term emissions reductions. It remains the case that there are infrastructural and reserve policy choices that must also be made by the UK Government to assist devolved nations in their net zero journey, not least in heat decarbonisation and carbon capture and storage. Yes. Dr. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. It's to go back to the, the point you made earlier about carbon capture, utilisation and storage. You know, is she really trying to tell us that if the ACON project had been given the go-ahead, that we would have actually been able to meet our 75 per cent target and we would actually have a climate change plan before us already? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as Mr Lumsden knows, uh, carbon capture and storage um, has been developed in the North East over many, many years and has had the funding taken away from it by subsequent Conservative governments. Now, I am not entirely sure that uh, the ACORN project could have been up and running and, uh, and, and, and capturing carbon by that period of 2030. But we would have known, we would have known that it would have been in train and that given that it is one of the most mature, the most ma mature propositions for carbon capture and storage and that, and that Storega have been working on it for the time they have, I, I actually think that it was, of all the projects across the UK, that it was the one that was most ready to go. And I think that Mr Lumsden and his heart of hearts agrees with me. The government's engagement over summer and the NZ Committee's evidence sessions on the bill makes it clear there is consensus from stakeholders, communities, experts and MSPs. We need to move fast to ensure Scotland has credible targets and a credible climate change plan as soon as possible. This bill is the first essential step in that uh, process, setting us on a new path while ensuring our system is solid and credible. And I urge members to support its passage through stage one and beyond. And I move my motion. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Edward Mountain to speak on behalf of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. Uh, around eight minutes, please.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to speak on behalf of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. In April of this year, the Scottish Government announced new legislation to repeal a statutory net zero target, and they accepted at that stage they couldn't meet it. With this, they announced a new approach to setting up monitoring emission reduction targets in the form of five-year carbon budget. Now, the committee stood ready to consider the bill, but there was an unacceptable delay, because it was not until the 5th of September that the bill was introduced. I accept it's a narrowly drawn bill, but, but technically quite complex. The short available for scrutiny should and could have been avoided. Nevertheless, I'd like to place on record my thanks to the committee members and indeed all of the clerks for their work in hearing from as many experts as we could and giving the Parliament some food for thought in our Stage 1 report. The report also makes use of our responses to pre-legislative calls for views over the summer. At this stage, I'd also like to thank the committee members from the Delegated Powers and Law Reform and Finance and Public Administration Committees for their work on the bill as well. And I'm extremely grateful, as indeed the committee are, for all those who gave evidence, especially for those who attended our meetings, often with little or sometimes no notice. The catalyst for this legislation is the Scottish Government's recognition that the 2030 net zero targets cannot now be met. That is a matter of regret. In removing this target, the bill will sweep away all other percentage-based annual targets. And there are some drawbacks to this, and these were clear and accessible ways of communicating ambition and progress to the public. However, we heard there are benefits in switching to carbon budgeting. And it will be a more flexible approach to setting emission reduction targets, and we largely welcome the way this has been delivered in the bill. This includes retaining an advisory role for the Independent Climate Change Committee. But the 75% and 90% interim targets remain important milestones on the path to net zero, and to lose them completely feels like going backwards. We recommended having these targets, as it were, translated into the new system with a revised scheduling for hitting them. I note what looks to be a cautious acceptance of this proposal but in the Acting Cabinet Secretary's response to our report. The timing and sequencing of key events under this new system was a major theme of our evidence taking. In our report, we tried to balance two important considerations, urgency and scrutiny. We are all agreed on the pressing need for new climate change plan to get our net zero back on track. However, this speed must not be at the expense of parliamentary consideration and, with it, the chance to hear from stakeholders and the wider public. The solution we suggest is for the Parliament to be able to consider the proposed carbon budgets and draft climate change plans at the same time. This all takes, also takes into account of the fundamental interconnectedness of targets and plans. Now, the Acting Cabinet Secretary's response on this recommendation is equivocal, but I do welcome her commitment to provide the Parliament with more information about how proposed carbon budgets target fits into the net zero pathway to help us make an informed choice when we consider those regulations. Another issue we discussed is whether the Scottish carbon budget should align with the UK carbon budgets, which are also for five years. <clears throat> Alignment does seem neater, and it may enable more effective cross-government working. Will it slow us down, though, to wait for the UK carbon budget in 2027 before setting a carbon budget ourselves? That was the question. Now, the committee couldn't reach a common position on alignment, but we agreed the discussion should continue, and we asked the Scottish Government to show more of its working on why it came down against UK alignment. Now, the Acting Cabinet Secretary has responded, and we can reflect further on this issue going forward into Stage 2, and I look to forward to being personally convinced that her proposals are the right ones. Now, the Bill does not touch directly on the context of climate change plans. However, stage one was an opportunity to take stock on the issue. The need for more detailed, for more flesh on the bones, was a recurring theme of our evidence. 
we heard that plans should set out estimates of the actual emissions reductions envisaged from specific policies and proposals. And we've also recommended the Scottish Government should work with the Scottish Fiscal Commission on the costs and benefits information to be provided in the Climate Change Plan. The Government must provide more robust information on costing, linking back to the Scottish budget itself. Parliament does need to be able to assess whether the Government has put in the money to match its ambitions. Another issue we considered was the Section 36 reports in context of the new carbon budgeting system. These reports are triggered when the Scottish Government needs to take corrective action in relation to missed targets. We didn't think it was right that could only trigger one report during the five-year lifetime of a carbon budget. That felt just too infrequent. It looks from her response that the Acting Cabinet Secretary is in part agreement, accepting the need for more clarity on the trigger point under the new approach and how early this should happen. We will wait and see what emerges at stage two. Turning finally to the policy memorandum and the financial mem memorandum, these were indeed short on detail. Indeed, they were just short. The government's view on this that is it is a technical bill that doesn't change the destination, namely to reach net zero by 2045, only on how we measure on how we're getting there. I do get that argument, but put on the record that there needs to be a cost and impact on people having to now push harder and faster to keep the 2045 goal in sight. I also note that the Finance and Public Administration Committee felt there was a general issue with the detail in the financial memorandums, and this is one example of that. To sum up, Presiding Officer, we recommend that Parliament agree to the general principles of the Bill at Stage 1, but this is also a time for some reflection and indeed regret. If we agree to this Bill, we will say goodbye to a 2030 target that expert did tell us was tough, but indeed achievable. Action has not kept pace with ambition, and therefore the Scottish Government must now take back the initiative and focus on the nuts and bolts of net zero delivery through this bill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr Mountain. I now call on Douglas Lumsden uh, to open on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thanks to the convener of the committee for keeping the, all the committee members together uh, during the course of uh, looking at the, the report. Um, and especially thanks to all the, the clerks for this excellent report that was turned around so quickly, uh, giving us the opportunity to discuss it today. Um, President Officer, the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee has taken as much time as possible to look at this legislation, but I think we all agree that more time is required to discuss this important issue and also need to reflect on why we are here today. We know that this Scottish Government has failed to meet its climate change targets, has failed to address the challenges that we are facing, and have failed to set out a clear plan on how, together, we can achieve net zero. This committee pulls no punches in its remarks on this matter, stating that action so far on reaching our ambitious climate change emissions reduction targets has been inadequate, yep. that the pace that has been forced onto the parliamentary process of this legislation is unsatisfactory, yep. and that we have done our best to listen to as wide a cross-section as we can in the time that was given to us. Yep. Parliamentary scrutiny should not be the loser in this SNP government's mismanagement of our climate change Absolutely. goals. Absolutely. Now, I understand that the Scottish Government are keen to be seen to be doing something quickly on this matter, but that does not mean they can charge ahead unchecked and without the adequate scrutiny and assistance from experts. Because this issue is too important, it's too big, it's too vital, and of too great significance to rush through without the adequate thought or thorough examination. There are three key areas by the committee that I want to focus my remarks on today. First of all, an issue that was raised repeatedly with the committee during our deliberations. Mm -hmm. Many of those who gave their time to respond to the committee mentioned the importance of alignment between what was happening here and what is happening in Westminster. It gave concern that there is nothing in the policy memorandum on alignment, and I would ask the Minister to clarify if they can why this happened. 
And the committee has made has, has very clear recommendations on, on this matter that the government should set out clearly its thinking on alignment with the UK carbon budgets, what evidence it gathered, and whether aligning would delay the Scottish Government working on new and improved plans to deliver net zero. Now, I, I welcome the response from the Scottish Government and their detailed response on this particular question, and it would be helpful if the committee could look at this again in light of that response. Yeah. Because I remain concerned at the lack of alignment on this matter, but I'm happy to take some additional time to consider this question as part of the bill moving forward. Of course, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I did give a comprehensive reasoning behind that, and I just want to make the offer, if there's anything that you believe is not in that response, the information that you need, um, you need to only ask, because we, we, there, are, there are pros and cons for both approaches, and we, we fully agree that. We have landed on the five-year carbon budget starting from next year for, for good reason. But if there's anything else that Mr Lumsden needs to do, just let me know. Thank you. And always through the Chair. Douglas Lumsden. Yeah, and, and I did uh, note I did welcome the response from the Cabinet Secretary, but I think that it would have been good to have that uh, clarity um, before we were doing our uh, report and before we were gathering evidence, because it would have been good to hear from other stakeholders what their thoughts would have been on the thinking from the, the Scottish Government. I'll take our intervention from Monica uh, Lennon. And I would advise members, we do have some time in hand. Monica Lennon. Excellent. I'm grateful to Douglas Lumsden, another member of the committee. Um, on the point of alignment, I think it is an issue to it's fair to say that the committee struggled with some of the evidence because we didn't really have strong views one way or the other. The CCC would prefer Scottish and UK carbon budgets to align, but they also said it could work either way. So as well as hearing more from the government's analysis, does Douglas Lumsden agree that it would be good for the committee stage two to have more external advice on this too? Douglas Lumsden. Yeah, ab absolutely. And it's good that we've heard a view from the Scottish Government, but it would have been good to have that to, you know, to talk to other members of, uh, from other organisations to see what their thoughts would have been uh, on that. And secondly, the issue of reporting is a key one, and it's regretful that the Bill will only permit one Section 36 report to be published at the end of each five-year carbon budget period. Such an important issue requires careful monitoring and reporting. There should be much more opportunity for this on the face of the Bill. And it's vitally important to the future of Scotland for us to get this right. And I know the committee are committed to working with the government to ensure that the bill achieves what we all want to achieve. Yep. And I note the response from the Cabinet Secretary on the issue of Section 36 reports and the lack of a trigger point in the five-year period. And hopefully, as the bill pro progresses, a statutory solution can be found. Another issue I feel is the financial uh, memorandum. Like most financial memoranda from this devolved government, it is weak. It's, it, it seems, again, we will be signing up for legislation with no real idea on the overall cost. The Finance and Public Audit Committee highlighted, highlighted its previous advice and asked, have all costs or benefits, except those of a genuinely marginal nature, been quantified, mm. including those likely to arise from secondary legislation? Yeah. Mm. And I think everyone can agree that we have no costs for secondary legislation, and we will only get that once we are a lot further down the road, and I think that's strong. I'll give it to Bob Doris. Bob Doris. Fellow committee member for, for giving way, would Mr Lumsden agree that given when five-year carbon budgets are set, we'll get 15 years' worth of them at the same time, and a 15-year climate change plan also, that it's not credible to have a detailed costing for spending in year five, year 10 and year 15, given some of the technologies don't even exist yet. Dr Sampson. Maybe not detailed, but it should be able to give a ballpark figure on how much things are going to cost. You know, we're, as I said, we're signing up to legislation with no real idea the true cost of that going forward. Because we heard from local authorities that they are concerned. They are concerned with costs and what funding will be, be made available for them as we ask them to change to allow the Scottish Government to meet its targets. President officer, I am concerned having this, this new bill will mean nothing if the devolved government don't follow up with actions. I'm worried that the net zero and energy budget has been cut by 23.4 million. The Scottish Government is set to miss four of their six recycling targets and has failed to achieve its key climate target for nine years out of the last 13. The record is not great and there's so much to be done. And, President officer, I have to mention the much delayed climate change plan. This is something we should have had a long time ago and it's shameful that the SNP government have got themselves 
into this situation. People are looking for clarity. They're looking for the direction of travel, and there really should have been some clarity long before now. The government need to commit to dates on when this new plan will be released. Because I'm fed up with the SNP government fobbing us off when it comes to plans and strategy. Of course. Cabinet Secretary. As I said in committee, we can give clarity on when the climate change plan will be, will be given in draft to the committee because we've set out in a letter that I read to the, wrote to the committee about when the CCC's advice is a timeline and when, what, what, what that would mean in terms of a draft coming to the committee. So he already has that information and he already has that commitment from me. Dr Sumson. Earlier, was you'd endeavour to bring it before um, recess next summer. It's not, that's not, I don't see that as a, a, a real commitment, Cabinet Secretary. So, as I said, I'm fed up with the SNP government fobbing us off when it comes to plans and strategies. The energy strategy is a prime example. We were told it has been imminent for months now, but still we have no sign of it. Maybe the Cabinet Secretary can intervene again right now and tell us when that will be released. Uh, cab okay. Cabinet Secretary, is, yes. is there an intervention there? Energy the, the energy strategy and just transition plan is actually in its final draft and simply has to go through Cabinet. Dr Sampson. Thank you. I think that was an answer we heard uh, last week and maybe the week before. Because I was actually looking for an answer. We were looking for dates of when the energy strategy would be here. People are looking for clarity and we don't get that from this SNP government. Presiding officer, it is vital that we get this right for Scotland and for future generations. We need a clear plan, measurable and achievable, and how we will achieve net zero by 2045. We need to be able to hold the government to account on when targets are missed or when we fall short. We cannot rush through this process without adequate time to consider the implications and impact of legislation on our communities and businesses across Scotland. We cannot rush through actions that will have adverse effect on our rural communities. As Scottish land estates say, the pursuit of net zero must not result in rural businesses and communities being negatively impacted by urban-focused policies. This is absolutely vital. President officer, we have to work with our partners across the UK to ensure that our plan is aligned right across the country. This is not something that we can achieve alone and must be done in partnership with business, local authorities and communities across Scotland and the UK. I hope that the government accept the recommendations of the committee and make changes to the bill, as I think there is a genuine will across all parties to make the legislation work for the whole of Scotland. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Lumsden. I now call on Sarah Boyack to open on behalf of Scottish Labour. Around six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I also want to thank the Net Zero Committee for their excellent report and for all of those who fed in their concerns and their judgment to the committee, especially given the incredibly short timetable that they were actually working to. And I do want to start by saying that Scottish Labour will support this bill at stage one, but we are hugely disappointed that we've actually ended up needing this bill. And we put it down to the fact we've had poor environmental leadership over 17 years of the SNP's time in government, which has meant that we have lost the opportunity to be a world leader in climate change. Our Parliament's targets were ambitious and they were celebrated for being bold, but the action by the Scottish Government has not matched the ambition in both the Climate Acts. And we've not seen the policy implementation. Uh, yes, Ben McPherson. Ben McPherson. I thank Sarah Boyett for taking that intervention and it was perfectly timed because there's quite a lot of time left on the clock for Sarah Boyett to speak and I wondered if you might want to use that time to say what you would have done differently in the last years. Always through the chair, Sarah Boyett. Oh, sorry. Oh, I, I used to be a lecturer so it could be at least an hour, uh, Mr McPherson. There are things that we have talked about and if you look at the recommendations by the Climate Change Committee, there was so much in there that we would have agreed with that would have been about action. And one of the things I want to focus on today, we've, we've missed nine out of 13 annual targets. We've got this bill being rushed through Parliament and that is because of failure to do the heavy lifting on the policies and the implementation. You only need to turn on the news to see Storm Milton battering the southeast of America to realise that the climate emergency is a now issue. And we could be debating this any week of the year and there would be another extreme weather climate challenge that people will be facing in the world. But it's closer to home too. Record temperatures, extreme rain and sea level rises, forest fires, impacting 
now in our urban and our rural communities. So across Scotland, we do need action and we need to address it now. So that's why Scottish Labour will be constructive and we will, if it's brief. Cabinet Secretary. One area of action that could be taken across the whole UK, given the UK has got a 2050 target and obviously the Welsh and Northern Irish governments have got targets as well for the net zero, would be adjust adjusting the electricity price so that we can actually use our renewable electricity to heat our homes in a way that isn't punitive for householders. Does she agree that there is reform needed there? Sarah Boyack. There is so much action we need. It's not just to make sure that the affordable electricity we're now producing benefits communities, and that could also be through community and cooperative ownership. It's also making our houses more energy efficient in the first place, so that people are not wasting heat and power in both urban and rural communities. And I think the Windsor report is something we should all be looking at. And the NISO launch last night that the minister was at as well. I think there's a lot of work we need to be doing together. So it is a now issue. I have appreciated working with the Cabinet Secretary Gillian Martin. She has shown a, a willingness to collaborate on the bill, but it can't all rely on the Cabinet Secretary and her colleague. This has to be a cross-government issue. It needs all, all departments, transport, planning, business, housing and rural affairs. And I worry that it's just seen as a climate issue. It cannot just be the Energy and Climate Directorate. Take transport, for, for instance. One of the bold new strategies uh, was to explore integrated ticketing, a policy from 2012. Scottish Government aims for a 20% reduction in car kilometres, but again, that's a goal from 2020 that still comes with no clear strategy. And if the Minister for Transport was as invested in net zero, no thank you, there is no way we would have seen the reinstalment of peak fares or the massively overcrowded and underserved train routes across Scotland. The third highest emitting sector in Scotland's buildings. And while the UK Climate Change Committee commended plans for the Heat and Buildings Bill, um, well, unless I can get a date for the, sorry, the, the colleague won't have the date for the heating buildings bill. We need detail on it soon because the legislation is still not in front of us and that means there's no confidence from investors and businesses that are absolutely vital, that will benefit businesses but also make our homes warm and affordable to heat and power and also our public sector buildings. And then there's a the need to support food, farming and land so that we get decarbonisation there as well. This is not a niche issue, it affects every day of our lives and all of our constituents. So while we do support this bill, we will work on a cross-party basis. We do not agree with each other on everything, but we will work to see that we can get amendments that will work for us in terms of increasing the transparency and the scrutiny that we need from this piece of legislation. And I would request from the Cabinet Secretary some kind of interim update, separate from the legal targets, just to make sure that the Parliament knows about the action that's being taken now, because the last update on the action we were getting was the so-called policy package when the targets were dropped, and that was in April. The time we get the new climate change plan in summer next year, it will have been well over a year since the updates. Mm -hmm. So we cannot afford to lose momentum, and I hope the Cabinet Secretary will commit to a statement between now and the climate change plan, at least to let us know what actions are being taken, what outcomes are expected, and enable the whole of Parliament to engage on this issue because we will disagree with each other but we also have to come together. We support the introduction of carbon budgets but the fact that we have to do this bill shows that, that there's been a failure. We need a whole government approach and the First Minister and his entire cabinet need to take this seriously every day. If they don't do that we're not going to make the change we urgently need. Scotland, our constituents and our planet cannot afford that so let's get on with this. Thank you, Ms Boyer. I now call on Mark Ruskell to open on behalf of the Scottish Greens. Around six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Well, it's clear that this climate bill must result in a reset of climate ambition. But to achieve that, there must be a level of honesty about what getting to net zero actually means and the choices that must be made. Yes, the 2030 target was ambitious. It was on the edge of what the UK Climate Change Committee believed was achievable. But it was also necessary that this parliament reflected what climate science demanded. Now, last week, Jim Ski, the chair of the IPCC, said that we're potentially heading towards three degrees of global warming by 2100 if we carry on with policies we have at the moment. 
Now, clearly, colleagues know three degrees would be utterly devastating for all life on this planet. But just six years ago, at the time that we set the 2030 target, Jim Ski also said that limiting warming to 1.5 degrees is possible within the laws of chemistry and physics, but doing so would require unprecedented changes. Now, unprecedented changes were what young people around the world were demanding on the streets at the time that we set that 2030 target. They demanded that we keep 1.5 alive. They demanded that we listen to the scientists to make the changes that remain today so necessary. But those unprecedented changes were not put forward by government. The climate plan that came out in 2019 largely fudged the issue. It didn't spell out the emissions reductions that could be achieved. Dozens of recommendations made by parliamentary committees to improve the plan were ignored, as were warnings from the Climate Change Committee to ramp up delivery. Quite simply, too little, too late. And it was obvious at the start of this session of Parliament that the 2030 target was starting to slip beyond reach. Now, as this bill looks to reset the way targets are measured and plans are made, we cannot ignore the need for government to take seriously the need for unprecedented action to tackle the climate emergency. Action is what Greens need to see alongside this bill if we are to give it our full support. And we are still waiting for a new energy strategy with a clear presumption against new oil and gas. We're still waiting for the plan to reduce car dependency. We're still waiting for a more climate compatible options for improving the A96. And we're still waiting for a decisive shift in subsidy to help farmers cut pollution. Decisions on these policies and many more will either lock in or lock out climate pollution in the years ahead. But the clarity is needed right now. I'll take an intervention on Graham Simpson. Simpson. Thank Mark Ruskell for taking the intervention. I'm really interested uh, to hear him outline some specific ideas uh, that he thinks could help um, reduce carbon emissions. Uh, Mark Ruskell. Well, I've just, I've just read out a list of specific ideas that will help Scotland to reduce its climate emissions. If Mr Simpson wants to go for a full gilling of the A96, I, I suspect that will result in enormous amounts of carbon emissions that will be locked in for decades ahead. Now, I've just said to Mr Simpson and the Chamber, if this Parliament wants to make decisions like that, we have to live with the consequences. If we go for high carbon infrastructure, it has a consequence. Yeah. So measure it, understand it. And if you want to trade that off against emission reduction somewhere else in the economy, make that decision. But we have to operate within now a carbon budget. And I think that's implicit within this legislation. Now, this bill does not alter climate ambition on the face of the bill. That would come through the setting of a carbon budget next year. But it does offer the opportunity to learn lessons from the last five years and especially the need to link action plans with financial budgets and the new carbon budgets. Now, aligning a five-year carbon budget with a clear costed plan will, I hope, deliver the kind of honest and transparent consideration of what is actually needed on the ground to get to net zero. The evidence presented on this by the Scottish Fiscal Commission was important, and I hope the government will consider giving them a formal role in the process going forward. If there's time in hand, I'll certainly take the Cabinet Secretary. Secretary. We'll be very brief, and I'm very grateful to Mark Ruskell. Does he, does he um, appreciate, though, that it won't be government money alone that will be able to take us to net zero? There has to be private investment encouraged in terms of setting out the direction of travel. And only with, with uh, private investment and other layers of government as well, leveraging in money, will we all be able to get to net zero? Mark Ruskell. Well, a a absolutely. Absolutely. But of course, the role of public investment in levering in responsible private investment is absolutely critical. And of course, we've seen that with the excellent work of my colleague Patrick Harvey, the Heat and Buildings. It's a, it's a hybrid model of public and private investment to deliver that change. But it's the plans, Cabinet Secretary, that we need to see going forward. So, five-year carbon budgets linked to action are broadly welcome, uh, but if budgets are being blown, then meaningful corrective action is important. We recently received two Section 36 reports in Parliament, which were meant to spell out the action that government is taking to make up for missed climate targets, but they didn't offer new actions, neither did they explain 
how restated policies would get us back on track. And clearly, the new legislation must put more of a requirement on these reports to spell out, and urgently, how course correction could be achieved, including the financial cost. Finally, um, Presiding Officer, um, how we take the whole society on this journey is really important. Scotland's first climate assembly, mandated under the 2019 Climate Act, delivered much needed and very honest conversations and made some critical recommendations to government, some of which were taken on, others were not. I do believe that government should consider embedding this approach to public participation in the new climate change bill. Presiding officer, once again we stand on the brink of disaster. The climate bill learns lessons and makes improvements, but it does not move us to safety. That can only come from this government redoubling a commitment to the unprecedented action demanded by the science and to deliver that alongside this bill. Thank you, Mr Ruskell. And I now call on uh, Liam MacArthur to open on behalf of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Around six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Can I too start by uh, thanking the uh, Net Zero Committee? It's hardly uh, a secret that the time frame in which the committee and indeed this parliament have been uh, asked to carry out our scrutiny role on this bill uh, is what could generously be uh, described as suboptimal. Uh, however, with the help of those who've given evidence to, to the committee, I think the committee has discharged its duties well and deserves uh, credit. I'll come on to the bill and indeed the committee's findings shortly, but first, like others, I uh, want to reflect on how it is that we find ourselves in this deeply regrettable position and, importantly, how this should inform uh, the approach going forward, which will be, uh, I think, essential if we're to have any hope of meeting our net zero uh, ambitions. I was uh, one of those intimately involved in shaping the Climate Change Act back in 2019, uh, Mark Roscoe being uh, another colleague uh, involved at that time. Indeed, I can lay claim to also having had a hand in passing similar legislation a decade earlier. I remember back in 2019 uh, that in a parliament of minorities, consideration of the bill was a genuine cross-party endeavour, something uh, that I think we'll need to see to, um, taken forward uh, in this instance. On the question of the interim target for 2030, former Labour uh, colleague uh, Claudia Beamish and I uh, uh, lodged the, um, the amendment eventually adopted uh, the figure of 75 per cent. And this was a compromise. The minister at the time, Rosanna Cunningham, argued strongly for a lower target, one that still looks unlikely to have, met, uh, to have been met as it happens. Uh, Green colleagues were intent on going for 80 per cent, a figure that seemed to have been plucked out of thin air at the last minute in an attempt to appear more radical. There appeared little uh, concern as to how 80 per cent might be achieved or that any conceivable pathway to meeting it would see a just transition comprehensively bypassed. And I'll give way to Mark Ruskell. Uh, I mean, I accept that target, looking back on it now, seems incredibly difficult to achieve. But it was a target, it was a debate about the climate science. And as I said earlier on, scientists like Jim Ski were saying that even with the 75% target, it would only give us a chance of meeting 1.5. So this was a debate about science. I agree with you, we should have also had the debate about how we actually get to those targets and what it would actually mean for society. And hopefully that's something that can now come through this new budgeting process. Always through the chair, Liam MacArthur. Uh, yes, and I would certainly agree with the final point that Mark Ruskell made, but I did note in his own comments, he said that the, the, the 2019 bill was on the edge of what was achievable. So what he was arguing at the time was essentially over the edge of what was achievable. And therefore, the 75% figure was finally agreed. Yes, the Minister made clear her misgivings. And yes, the UK Climate Change Committee agreed it would be a stretching target. But the UKCCC also agreed that it was achievable subject to appropriate actions being taken by government, both Scottish Government and UK Government. And it is that uh, end of the bargain that has not been upheld, despite repeated and consistent warnings from the UKCCC that detailed action plans mapping out a route to achieving our interim target were needed. The Scottish Government paid no heed and failed to deliver. The blame, of course, always lay elsewhere. Pointing out shortcomings in the workplace car parking charge or the infamous bottle return scheme uh, were evidence, according to ministers, that it was all the opposition's fault or Westminster. Seldom was responsibility acknowledged, accepted and acted upon by Scottish ministers, either pre or post the Butte House Agreement. Yet, at the same time, we had Nicola Sturgeon and Hamza Youssef trotting the globe, lecturing leaders of other countries about Scotland's world-leading record on tackling climate change. 
None of those leaders had the heart to point out that the only time the Scottish Government had met its emissions reduction targets was thanks to the shutdown caused by COVID. So whatever approach is taken uh, going forward, we need less hubris and hype and more of a focused, detailed, painstaking and consistent uh, commitment to action. In this re uh, respect, like Sarah Boyack, I do want to acknowledge the approach taken by the Cabinet Secretary and her officials. Most of what I've described um, thus far predates Gillian Martin's arrival to the post, and I genuinely welcome the collaborative approach um, with which she's gone about trying to build uh, consensus and also uh, rebuild uh, trust. Even the ridiculous time frame for considering this bill was something she inherited. And on the subject of the bill in the committee's stage one findings, I agree that a framework based on carbon budgeting is an appropriate way to proceed at this stage. It provides necessary flexibility, allowing for the corrective action that uh, Mark Ruskell uh, mentioned in his contribution. Although I think the committee is also right to highlight the need for government to find a way of translating the 75% target and indeed the 90% target for 2040 into the new system of carbon budgets. Similarly, Scottish Liberal Democrats support the five-year period proposed for each carbon budget and note the debate around whether this needs to be aligned to the UK budget cycles. Uh, I'm relatively relaxed about that. I see the pro pros and cons in, in both um, and will be interested to see where the committee goes at stage two on this. What can't be allowed to happen, however, is for any alignment uh, to delay plans uh, for delivering net zero. The final point I want to make is around transparency and scrutiny going forward. Obviously, this is a framework bill with much of the detail to come forward in due course. And given the significance of that detail, the fact that we are where we are, uh, precisely because of the absence of detailed action plans, it's imperative that the government adopts an open book approach to the options being considered. This can aid scrutiny by this parliament, but as importantly, it can provide an opportunity for stakeholders, whether business, local government, third sector and others, to have their say in shaping the decisions that are taken, decisions that will affect them very directly uh, and which very often will rely upon them to deliver. Presiding officer, this uh, bill is a reflection of failures. Uh, we cannot afford to find ourselves in this position again. We need to move past what Chris Stark former head of UKCCC, described as the sugar rush phase of target setting and onto the serious business of developing detailed plans for delivering on our, um, our collective net zero commitments. And having been involved in passing two previous climate change bills, when it comes to delivery, I hope it's third time lucky. And in that hope, Scottish Liberal Democrats will be voting in favour of this bill at decision time this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. MacArthur. And we will now move to the open debate. And I call Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Maurice Golden. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. I am delighted to be able to take part in this afternoon's debate as a member of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee and to talk to the Stage 1 report on the Climate Change Emissions Reduction Targets Scotland Bill. First of all, I'd also like to take the time to thank the clerks for all their hard work in getting the Stage 1 report completed so quickly. The witnesses who gave up their valuable time by responding to the calls for views, by writing to the committee and or attending committee to give evidence, and of course my fellow members of the committee for the way the process was conducted. Scrutinising this bill has been a reminder to me that what is exciting and what is important are not always the same thing in politics. Some folk might not think changing the way we set standards for emission reduction exciting, but it is an important piece of work and an important bill. The start of the recommendations from the committee report on this bill includes a line that I want to repeat because it, it straight away goes to the principle of this bill. The committee accepts that a framework based on carbon budgeting is a better and more flexible system for setting targets for emission reductions than the current approach. That move to carbon budgets is the crux of what the bill is about. The bill proposes a shift from annual and interim targets to a carbon, budget, a carbon budgeting system, which is seen as more flexible and effective. And I absolutely agree with that statement. The current system that we are looking to replace can end up with an annual target being missed or achieved down to how cold or mild a winter we have had, and, and, and can leave our nation's pr progress being judged purely down to the politics of the day in chamber, rather than the science, 
the evidence and the advice given from experts. With that said, and as is noted in the report, emission reductions, which we have just now, and the targets associated with those, are simpler to understand. It is much easier to go, here is what our carbon emissions were in 1990, and here is what emissions are in 2024, than it is to talk about remaining carbon budgets. Using carbon budgets, however, allows for an averaging out of our carbon footprint, which can mean that we're not exceeding our target one year when there's a mild winter, and then missing it the following year completely if the whole winter is pure Baltic. I also want to highlight that the biggest target of all, of being net zero by 2045, still has a credible path to be achieved. As part of that, I want to remind folk that we talk about net zero and not just zero when it comes to carbon emissions. Because, of course, carbon can be captured as well as just being emitted. Our planet, mainly through carbon sinks like our oceans, rainforests and other woodlands, is able to remove some CO2 from our atmosphere. Over and above that, there is also some scope for engineered processes. And I wouldn't be doing my job as a North East MSP if I didn't mention the ACORN project. The ACORN project is a project that by 2030 could see up to 10 million tonnes of CO2 being captured every year. And in the process, safeguarding thousands of jobs and contributing billions to the economy. And I'm still amazed it wasn't awarded to track one status by the last UK government. And even more amazed that when the new Labour UK government announced £22 billion of carbon capture funding last week, the Acorn project didn't even get a mention. I'll take an intervention. From whom are you taking the intervention? Sorry, I just saw, saw Mr uh, Lumsden. I, I seem to be indicating Mr Lumsden. Good, good choice there. I'm um, just wondering, obviously the, the Scottish Government had committed £80 million towards carbon capture and utilisation and storage. How much of that's actually been spent? Jackie Simbar. That is a question for the Scottish Government, but if only the last UK Government had actually given the same amount of money to Just Transition, we might actually be in a better place, Mr Lumsden. So it is all well and good uh, talking about targets, but given the ACORN project to go ahead would have been a huge step towards meeting those targets, however they are measured. Net zero is not going to happen without investment. And this bill has been expedited, and then some have been saying that the government could have done more. But I kind of fail to see how. The Cabinet Secretary announced on the 18th of April this year that the bill would be brought to Parliament before summer recess. However, just five weeks later, a UK election was called, and we entered into PERDA. This shortened the period that we could have had to scrutinise. And that is a matter that seems to have been of some contention. But if opposition members are wanting to water down the restrictions of PERDA, I guess it could make the next election really more interesting. I'll finish on one final point, President Officer. As we consider Scotland's journey to net zero today, I'd remind everyone here that it is a global challenge, and many folk across the world are looking to Scotland to see what we're doing. To conclude, I am pleased that the committee supports the Bill's general principles of this Bill. We need to get on with it, get this Bill in place, get to our targets and get to net zero. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Barr. I now call Maurice Golden to be followed by Bob Doris. Mr Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, let me begin with a note of agreement and welcome the fact the Bill will introduce carbon budgeting. I agree with the Cabinet Secretary that carbon budgets can provide a more reliable framework for progress in reducing emissions, which begs the question why the Scottish Government have waited so long to introduce them. I should also say that I am pleased to see there will still be annual reporting on emissions reductions, even if the emissions targets themselves are being ditched. But if carbon budgets are to be more effective, we need to see them aligned with the wider UK carbon budget. That's common sense, yeah. and we must have a robust reporting regime. We want the, this bill to work, which is why we are submitting amendments on these points, and I hope the Scottish Government will work with us on that. Yeah. Specifically on reporting, the Scottish Government have consistently struggled with emissions targets, uh, an issue 
I will return to later. So we need to ensure this pattern isn't repeated with carbon budgets. That's why we need increased scrutiny and parliamentary statements should there be failure to meet their carbon budget. Mm -hmm. Ministers would then be required to both explain the reason for such failure and set out what they are going to do to get back on track. Not only is there practical value in these measures, I believe they would help create a better sense of ministerial accountability, which would go some way to restoring public trust in the government's co commitment to climate change. For similar reasons, I am also looking to strengthen the Bill's approach to interim targets. The Net Zero Committee have noted their regret that the 2030 and 2040 emissions targets are being ditched. I would go further and say it causes further damage to the Scottish Government's already tarnished record on climate change. Mm -hmm. I think we need to restore a sense of urgency and commitment to climate action, which is why I want to see interim targets for 2030 and 2040. The principle of having a target is recognised by the Scottish Government, namely the net zero target for 2045. Happy. Cabinet Secretary. And I hope it's a helpful one. I'm, I'm really interested in everything that Maurice Golden has to say in terms of climate change because he's very invested in this. I would like to know from him what uh, big interventions in terms of the climate change plan he would like to see in a climate change plan that would really move the dial on this. Maurice Golden. Well, I'll give you one that doesn't cost any money. Complete radical reform of public procurement. If we had uh, a series of new frameworks around circular economy, uh, procurement, so moving from one-off purchases to rental and, and leasing models, that would help to pump prime the entire wider economy and ultimately encourage both the third sector to be engaged but also businesses to also adopt similar approaches. And I think that would be really helpful. Uh, I, I've got further suggestions around attitude to risk from public sector bodies as well, particularly if they're awarding a contract to a smaller business or third sector organisation, they are sometimes reticent to do that. And I think if we're going to be successful in this space, there's lots of work we could do uh, in that. But uh, turning away and, and moving on to the next draft climate change plan, it's been delayed for far too long. And my concern is that Parliament simply won't have the time to properly consider suggestions for amendments. Uh, and changes. I have already raised this issue with ministers, but I want to see a firm commitment to this bill get, uh, in this bill to get the draft published by summer next year, and I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's comments on that. Deputy Presiding Officer, on carbon budgets and other specific aspects of, of the bill, there is clearly work to do. But I want to turn now to the wider context of the bill, because it is no understatement to say that we really cannot afford for it to fail in its objectives. We have seen too much failure already because, as much as I have always commended the Scottish Government for showing ambition in tackling climate change, the fact remains they keep missing targets. They have failed nine times in the last 13 years, yeah. all of which, I assure the Cabinet Secretary, is said to be constructive. The job of opposition is to point out when things are going wrong and a responsible government should be able to hold up its hands and admit nine misses is frankly awful. So, if this bill is going to succeed, then we need to see a change in attitude from the SNP. They need to be honest about what's going wrong. When they abandoned the 2030 net zero target back in April, they didn't mention it at the time that they'd known they were almost certain to miss the target seven months before announcing yeah. it. Shocking. They need to work constructively. When the Circular Economy Bill was going through Parliament, opposition members put forward amendments to strengthen it. Yeah. But instead of accepting these good faith proposals, the SNP watered down the bill. Yeah. And if they need to back up their words with actions. The SNP can't claim to lead on climate change when they've delayed the next draft climate change plan with no date in sight, or when they've cut the more than £23 million from the net zero and energy budget. This bill is an opportunity to put these failures behind them, work across Parliament and deliver policy that will ensure we stay on the road to net zero. Yeah.
Thank you, Mr. Golden. And I now call Bob Doris to be followed by Casey Clark. Mr. Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And sitting on the Net Zero Committee, can I thank Clarks, can I thank Spice, all the witnesses that gave evidence, and fellow committee members for their efforts in meeting a challenging timescale for completing our Stage 1 scrutiny. Whilst very far from ideal, I would stress that a condensed period of scrutiny does not mean a compromise, le does not mean a compromise level of scrutiny. And I would point to two factors. Firstly, the effectiveness of the pre-publication call for evidence from our committee in drawing out key issues. I would commend the convener for his key role in relation to that. And secondly, we heard from 15 witnesses across 14 organisations and groups, not including also the Cabinet Secretary and her officials. So, robust but condensed scrutiny. I do believe that this exercise has been quite sobering, however, not just for the Scottish Government, we have to be very honest about that, but for Parliament as a whole. I think when we reflect on the revised targets from 2019, and I reread the stage three debate earlier today, we may just need to acknowledge that whilst they may have been at the outer reaches of what was achievable, they were earnest, they were well intentioned, and they were ambitious. But I'm not sure with hindsight, and that always, of course, is 2020 vision, presiding officer, that they were that credible. During the passage of that legislation, there was an 80% target suggested a 77% target suggested. We landed on 75%. The Scottish Government suggested 70%. And the 70% was based on advice from the UK Climate Change Committee. They said 70% was the prudent target, and Parliament went for 75%. So whatever we do from here on in, let's never get into a bidding war again over what targets are credible in this place for achieving net zero. Let's work and follow the evidence. Of course, yes. Cabinet Secretary. I am very cognisant of the, the fact that the committee has, has, has requested more information ahead of their scrutiny of the secondary legislation. Would you agree with me that um, an offer from, from myself and my officials to put as much information of the potential options that there might be with regard to getting to whatever target that, that we are putting forward, will be essential in the committee having that, that making that, that informed decision. Bob Doris. Uh, I thank the cabinet secretary for that intervention. Yes, I, I, I would uh, appreciate that, and I hope those options are very much options for actions on the ground that are tangible, not abstract policy papers. But I would really welcome that. So, our commitment uh, to net zero for 2045, President Officer, that does refrain, uh, remain a firm commitment across all political parties here. And getting there, we must uh, retain that ambition, but it must also ensure the route map is both credible and realistic. Fundamentally, notwithstanding recommendations within our report, I believe this bill, and with it our nation's pivot to a five-year carbon budgeting process, is a key part, not the only part, but a key part of ensuring we build that credibility into our net zero target for 2045. That is why our committee was unanimous in backing the general principles of this bill. Now, let me turn to some of the recommendations uh, within the report. Recommendation 5, President Officer, asked the Scottish Government to consider laying the draft climate change plans at the same time as laying regulations for carbon budgets. The key word, I suppose, is consider. That, that, that's the word we chose as a committee. Uh, it would clearly be desirable also to allow maximum scrutiny of those carbon budgets. However, we have also heard this could be challenging and have practical implications given the Scottish Government remains clear in its view that carbon budgets must be set in law before a draft statutory climate change plan is published. I find that frustrating, but on balance probably realistic. However, I do welcome the Scottish Government will reflect further on this and, at the very least, Presiding Officer, look at what detailed information regarding uh, the development of plans can be provided at the point where carbon budgets are introduced uh, to this Parliament. However, I want to be clear about something. Let me follow through this line of logic, President Officer. In one respect, none of this actually matters. Carbon budgets are a recasting of targets. It's actions, not targets, that deliver net zero. All roads would lead to delivery, on the ground delivery, of actions and of targets within the climate change plan. That reality very much sits at the heart of our committee recommendations 
at 4 and 11 within the executive firm, uh, uh, summary. They were clear that we need clear policy actions but associated costings to allow a laser-like focus on scrutiny and delivery. If I have time, pray not. Briefly, Sarah Boyack. Uh, can I say to the member, I think that's a very important point, but it's both about expenditure and benefits, and that without spending or without investing, we miss out, not just in terms of reducing climate emissions, but other wider economic and social benefits that could come. So it's an important recommendation, but it needs to be both. Would the member agree? Bob Doris? Uh, I, I think I, I would agree with that, but I think what I would say is we have to come together as a parliament to work out exactly how we, how we think an acceptable level of detail in those costings and benefits uh, can, be, can be drawn up to give credibility, not just for government, for parliament, to have confidence in our climate change plans going, going forward. Um, so the Scottish Government agrees uh, and its, res its response uh, outlined existing provisions that exist in relation to the, the costings for previous climate change plans. But that said, I welcome the Scottish Government was open to reviewing this to see what more can be done. We've heard from Sarah Boyack. I think there absolutely is more that can be done. And I know our committee will follow that with great interest. For my part, I would add that it's not just the costs of the actions to deliver net zero uh, for government. It's across all sectors of the Scottish economy and all aspects of our way of life. It's not simply budgets in this place. It will also require significant, significant private sector investment. Should we forecast that investment? And there will be cost implications for businesses. We should not pretend there won't be. And for households, let's not pretend that there won't be. And for workers. And that brings in the just transition, of course. So we need an open and ongoing and honest debate about all of that. Likewise, we need to be, uh, have the political courage in Scotland's Parliament and a non-partisan uh, environment to be just as open and honest about whether UK government budgets, just as when we set Scottish budgets here, whether those UK government budgets and consequentials that flow to this place are sufficient, whether wider pan-UK policy frameworks are sufficient to help Scotland deliver net zero. Calling that out and questioning that is not a blame game. It's coming together on a non-partisan basis to help deliver net zero. I was going to a couple more brief comments, President Officer, if I have time. Well, Mr Doran, I think you should be started bringing remarks to a close. Thank you. Uh, well, I think I will bring them to a close and, and merely say that uh, I don't necessarily support alignment uh, in relation to UK carbon budgets, and I welcome the additional reassurances and reporting that the Scottish Government has given in response to our Stage 1 report. And, and I thank uh, the Committee uh, for all its work, as I've said before, for what I think is a splendid piece of scrutiny. Thank you, Mr Doris. I now call Casey Clark to be followed by Michael Matheson. Ms Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And it's a pleasure to take part in this debate, particularly as somebody that's not a member of the committee and hasn't been involved in all the discussions that have been taking place in this parliament, because the debate about what targets should be how we achieve them, which of course is the important thing, why we need carbon budgets and why collectively we need to step up to this challenge should be central really to what we're all thinking about um, in this parliament and beyond because ch climate change and the effects of climate change really should be at the forefront of our mind. Um, and I accept that there is a political consensus in this parliament. We need to step up to that challenge, but I think we also need to be honest with ourselves in that none of us have really done everything that we should be doing um, and we need to do far more than we have done. We know that the Scottish Government has missed nine out of 13 targets so far and have missed eight in the last 12 years. Um, we know that they have failed to produce their climate change plan in late 2023 and I believe we still have a legal deadline of late November to produce a plan which of course is why um, we're having this debate today um, but I think you know collectively we do need to agree that we need to put every available resource to make sure that we do everything we can to drive down our emissions the climate change committee um, Yes, of course. Lorna Slater. I mean, every available opportunity, does that mean Labour-led councils will be working on the implementation? Could, could we please have Ms Slater's okay. microphone? Sorry. Every available opportunity, does that mean that Labour-led councils in Scotland will be implementing the workplace parking levy, which would not only raise money for investing in public services, but incentivise a reduction in traffic? 
Casey well, Clark. I'm, I'm not going to use my time here today to, to debate the pros and cons of the parking levy. Um, there are many actions that need to be taken, and the member will be full, fully aware of the debate um, that's taken place around that issue. But political parties um, in councils up and down Scotland also need to be having this discussion, and we need to be providing leadership. The Climate Change Committee of this Parliament deemed that the 2030 target of 75% reduction was beyond credibility, um, and uh, also said that the introduction of multi-year budgets would provide a more reliable indicator of underlying progress uh, and said that five years was most appropriate given that both the UK and Welsh Government are already doing this. And I agree that this is something um, that the Parliament and the Scottish Government should consider, um, but I think we do need to have a proper discussion of the pros and cons of that, and I personally am not aware of all of the arguments on both sides, so I hope that is something that we're able to come back to and discuss um, as a Parliament. The Committee um, also said that in each Scottish budget there should be a detailed plan accompanying it, identifying what actions will be needed to achieve it, and I hear that Lorna Sleet has got one specific proposal, but there will be a raft of measures um, that need to be taken and laying out what um, those policies will be and that an evaluation plan will be needed to track indicators to identify whether um, the deployment of scaling up at pace um, required is actually taking place. And I think, um, as Liam MacArthur says, um, we've had a series of failures um, on, on this agenda um, and more detailed consideration of some of the specifics is something that maybe as a parliament we need to be looking at more regularly. Because it's become abundantly clear, whilst um, not enough is being done, um, that um, there is a will, I think, in all political parties in this parliament to do more. Um, I'm therefore supportive of this bill, but um, agree that far more needs to be done um, to address the climate um, emergency. Um, but I think um, in the short time available to me, I'd like to focus on what that means um, to ordinary people, because we also have to be looking very carefully at um, what a just transition means in this parliament. Much of the debate um, has been focused on a just transition um, for oil and gas workers who will be at the centre of any move away from fossil fuel usage. Um, and I hope that the Scottish Government is working with the new UK Government to ensure that we have a concrete plan for energy um, transition jobs in Scotland and that we're beginning to put... Yes, I'd be happy to. I can Kevin imagine Stewart. what it might be. Forgiving way. Uh, and while she is making an ask of the uh, Scottish Government around about protection of oil and gas workers in that just transition, my appeal would be uh, to Katie Clark, presiding officer, to ensure that the Chancellor of the Exchequer in her budget does not muck up the allowance regime which could lead to job losses amounting to some 30,000, according to Unite the Union. Katie Clark. And there's work going on in this issue, but what I would say to the member that I'm not the Chancellor of the Exchequer, I make representations um, to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, but that um, I know that, that Scottish Labour um, is fighting to make sure that as much is done as possible to make progress as quickly as possible. Um, colleagues um, will be aware um, that Unite the Union, for example, have launched their No Ban Without a Plan campaign, which calls for new jobs to be commensurate with current workers' roles. We need to have pay protection and we need to have training to allow workers to transition to the jobs of the future. The experience of working people in the past has been of unjust transitions and they have no reason to believe that it's going to be different this time. If we allow Grangemouth to close, it's going to be looked at again by working people to see whether warm words have become a reality. Now, in many ways, the closure of Grangemouth isn't just about climate change, as far wider issues here. Um, but we need to make sure um, that we build the support for the actions needed to reduce our carbon emissions. That has caused implications, and it needs the support of all of the community. So um, we can't continue um, with an economy um, being at the mercy 
of corporate profiteering that dramatically increases people's energy bills. And we need to move to a system of greener, cleaner energy at a price we can all afford. And we need to have a strategy that gets the support of the whole population um, for the changes that we need to make. We know that we are seeing the devastating effects of climate change across the world. We are more and more beginning to see it in our own country. We must do more, we must do it collectively, and we can't wait longer for real action to be taken. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Clark. I now call Michael Matheson to be followed by Ben McPherson. Mr Matheson. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. And like other members of the committee, can I offer my thanks to the CLAPS for uh, managing to decipher the various views that were provided by committee members in the drafting of the Stage 1 report uh, and also to those witnesses who uh, presented that committee and also those who made submissions to the committee in its drafting of the Stage 1 uh, report. Uh, I agree, although the uh, convener of the committee is no longer in his seat, I do agree with him that this is uh, largely a technical bill. And it's a technical bill, though, which has been wedged into what I think is a very complex policy area. And at times can be challenging for the uninitiated to understand the different parts of the system and the roles that they play in helping to make sure that we are making sufficient progress in tackling the issue of carbon emissions. In saying that, it's also potentially one of the most significant bills that this Parliament will pass in this parliamentary session. Because the application of uh, carbon budgeting over a 5, 10, 15 year period has got very significant implications for government spending across a whole range of policy areas. Therefore, although being short and technical in nature, it is an extremely important piece of legislation, particularly given the impact that it can have on policy spending commitments in the next couple of decades but also in making sure that Scotland plays its important part, small though it may be, in tackling what is the twin crisis of the issue of climate change and biodiversity loss. What I, in my view, is the biggest global challenge that we have ever uh, faced. I do acknowledge, and we've heard some of it in the course of the debate so far, those who are critical of what is viewed as being a lack of progress that has been made uh, to date. But I do think it would also be churlish not to recognise and acknowledge the progress that has been made over the course of the last decade and a half. I think the Cabinet Secretary was right to highlight that we are over halfway uh, to achieving our net zero ambitions by 2045. That is not an effort that has just been made by government in itself, it has been made by a whole range of stakeholders whether it be in the private sector, through the decarbonisation of our energy system, to those who work in our community groups and helping to encourage recycling, and also who have been critical, I think, in pushing the whole area of the circular economy much more effectively here in Scotland. But despite the progress that has been made, there is absolutely no room for complacency in this area. And I do believe that the bill provides an opportunity for something of a reset in making sure that we are taking what will need to be the urgent and sustained action in order to meet our climate change objectives. I do believe that moving to a form of five-year carbon budgeting is a process which will prove to be more flexible and also, I believe, should help to improve transparency around the progress and the approach that government is taking. And I think that issue of transparency in the approach that government is taking is one which is critical, in my view, from my experience in government over an extended period of time. Because the five-year carbon budgets or any climate change plan is not simply an ownership of the Cabinet Secretary for net zero or the Minister who is responsible for climate change. I agree with Sarah Boyack. This is an area of policy that requires collective responsibility right across government in a way that I believe that we have sought to achieve, particularly in recent years. But what I think carbon budgeting 
will assist us in having a much more transparent approach about how different parts of government are playing their part. And that then brings me on to what I think is an important issue, and that is the need to make sure that the scrutiny process of carbon budgeting and the climate change plan, which will sit along that, alongside that, is one which is robust and effective to give government the opportunity or Parliament the opportunity to scrutinise these issues effectively. I also think that we should also just reflect on how we have arrived at the circumstances we now find ourselves in for this particular uh, bill. It is, as I think has been pointed out, the 75 per cent target that was set back in 2019 went beyond that was recommended by the independent experts on the Committee on Climate Change. They recommended between 65 and 67 per cent as being in line with and achievable in line with achieving net zero by 2045. And I recognise and accept that Parliament set a different target in that. But I think it's important for us as a Parliament to recognise that setting targets, by and large, is the easy part, the very easy part. Because if we are to achieve those targets, we are going to have to make policy decisions that will not always be easy. They will require leadership, not just leadership at a government level in individual portfolios, but it will require political leadership right across this chamber. It is easy for us to say we should do a bit more of this and a bit more of that, but not being specific about exactly what that should be. If we are serious about achieving these targets, it requires political leadership across the chamber to step up and make some of those very difficult decisions and to back policy options that will have an impact and, at the same time, could also prove to be controversial. That requires, that requires leadership, not just at a governmental level, but also here in this chamber. And I, I hope, must ask you to conclude, Mr Matheson. I, thank you, President Officer. I hope, in drawing this together, that members in the chamber will take that opportunity on board. Finally, President Officer, in drawing my remarks to a close, can I say that the issue around Section 36, I hope that the government will recognise the need for the legislation to be amended in order to make sure that there is a consistent approach to making sure we deal with any gaps that open up during the course of a five-year carbon budget period. But I do believe this is legislation which, if properly enacted, can make a real difference in driving forward meeting our climate change targets. Thank you. And I call on Ben McPherson, the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, President Officer. And as a former member of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee and still a substitute member, I'm very pleased to speak in this important debate and also to uh, put on record my thanks and admiration for the clerks and the work that they've done in this uh, very um, pressed timetable in order to, to progress to stage one um, and the work of the, the convener and, and other members as well. The issue of the timescales, uh, of course, uh, as Jackie Dambar referenced, was related to the issue of PARDA and the general election. And I do think that raises a question about why yeah. the, uh, the, the, the UK Parliament um, does not have to have consideration to this Parliament when it is in an election period, but the other way around, it causes these issues um, in terms of timetabling and the, the pressure that, that puts on. Moving to, to the bill, uh, we know that um, back in the spring, the Climate Change Committee uh, made the uh, public announcement about the challenges around the 2030 target, and the government has responded with this primary legislation and the changes that are set out uh, therein within the, within the proposed Act. This does, of course, come uh, from a position where there has been much progress. Of course, we are all disappointed that the progress has not been uh, significant enough for various factors in order to meet the 2030 target, but we do have to be realistic, as the Cabinet Secretary said. Um, that being said, figures, of course, do confirm that Scotland is now halfway to net zero, achieving the largest reduction in emissions of any nation in the UK and decarbonising faster than the EU27 average. And at the same time, our economy has grown by 67 per cent in real terms, demonstrating that tackling climate change and growing our economy can go hand in hand. And I will come back to that 
in a minute. Yeah, sure. Sarah Boyack. I appreciate the member taking an intervention because I very much agree that we need to highlight the benefits of tackling climate change in terms of the economy, but it could also be people's homes, transport connectivity, new manufacturing opportunities. So rather than seeing it as a here's a problem and it's difficult to solve, here are the opportunities and here's how we could work together. Ben McPherson. I, I think that is an absolutely brilliant point by Sarah Boyack, and I couldn't agree more, and I've said that. Uh, on many occasions in the chamber here and round the committee table. And I would refer also to the evidence that Chris Stark gave on the 23rd of April, uh, which he makes that point very clearly. And if I have time, I'll, I'll come back to that. In terms of the success, as well as reducing uh, targets and the, uh, uh, sorry, as well as reducing emissions towards the targets, uh, and as well as the social and economic benefits that, that Sarah Boyack has outlined and other ha others have as well, we shouldn't forget also the the technological and skills and knowledge development that's taken place over that period. You know, if I think about uh, the innovation that's happened, for example, in my constituency, if we think of Nova Innovation, the tidal energy company, you know, not only are they developing engineering solutions and expertise that can be utilised, whether it's research or the manufacturing product elsewhere in the world, but they're also exporting technology that is reducing emissions elsewhere. And so it's not just about Scotland's impact on reducing emissions here in Scotland because we have to be factual that our contribution to global climate change is very, very small. Uh, if we want to make a contribution to the wider challenge, it's actually what we export in terms of expertise, knowledge and technology that will, will make the biggest impact. Um, going back to the, the legislation in terms of uh, the, one of the main points, which is uh, the, the multi-year carbon budgets, these uh, can provide a more reliable framework for sustained progress in emissions reduction uh, as volatility is smoothed out over the, the budget period. Uh, and this position is reflected by the Climate Change Committee who have advised that carbon budgets are the most appropriate indicator of underlying progress in emissions reduction, uh, already a well-established model used by other countries such as France, Japan and Wales. They also uh, help in the, the management and and navigation of public opinion uh, and trying to move through to, to take people with us uh, and the political challenges uh, in, a, in a competitive uh, democracy when political parties are, are you know, considering their offers at election. Because as Chris Stark said in an answer to me on the, on the 23rd of April, he said, the point is that there is an idea that something that goes beyond the parliamentary cycle must be done and that it is the responsibility of government in each of those parliamentary cycles to keep the show on the road. That is easier with carbon budgets because you are pointing towards a thing that will go into the next session of Parliament, the one after that and the one after that. There is then a duty on government to do the right things in that session. So in terms of our collective political challenge, uh, five-year carbon budgets sh should be useful uh, if we pass this legislation. Because um, we do need to take the people with us, uh, and that is a, a challenge and a responsibility for all political parties. And I would just conclude, as, as other members, uh, including uh, Sarah Boyack, who inter intervened on me, have, have emphasised that the, the, the benefits to this country, to quote Chris Stark again, of achieving net zero are immense, not just to the climate, but in the form of jobs, to the landscape around us, to the trade, and to a host of social issues. Those reasons, alongside climate benefits, are why we should want to pursue net zero. Warmer homes, reducing the cost of electricity, cleaner air, more exercise, better diet, better use of land. All of these things are part of it. And just in that, I, I, I haven't heard all the evidence that the committee took at stage one, but one thing that I did think when the bill was published was that the long title should perhaps be the net zero emissions reduction targets Scotland bill. I think that would be a more accurate descriptor and maybe something the government could think about. Thank you. We move to winding up speeches and I call on Patrick Harvey up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would obviously want to echo the thanks that have been put on record by other members to the, to the committee and to its clerks and, and others who have supported a very rapid scrutiny process. But I think across political parties there has been a recognition that nobody really wants to be here. Uh, nobody really should be proud uh, of the fact that this bill has been necessary to introduce or that it's necessary for us to consider it. The first two climate acts that this parliament debated and passed 
were statements of ambition. This one is a statement of failure. It's a recognition that we are years behind where we should be on climate uh, and that Scot Scotland has not managed to be the climate leader that we all aspired for Scotland to be. Back in 2009, the setting of climate targets in the first place into law, uh, I, I think, again, by taking part in the international process, even as a non-state party, by advocating for concepts like climate justice and loss and damage, uh, and building international credibility uh, in its climate position, the Scottish Government uh, tried to do the right thing uh, in building that credibility. But we claimed that credibility and then failed to earn it since. It's been recognised that this is uh, a narrow bill. And I think that's part of the problem. It's certainly core to the discomfort that I have in debating uh, a narrow technical bill when we should be debating the profound policy change that's required to get us back on track. Um, prior to uh, Gillian Martin taking over as acting cabinet secretary, the, the cabinet secretary, uh, Mary McAllen, I think was wrong to describe this as a minor legislative amendment. No. What this is, is a fundamental point in the journey that we've been on. We've had climate legislation and statutory targets for 15 years. And during that, uh, that 15 years, we've seen inadequate pro uh, progress toward meeting uh, those targets. If the next 15 years follow the same pattern, game over. We can wave goodbye to net zero if the next 15 years see a similar lack of progress. We have a good story to tell on decarbonising electricity, pretty much flatline emissions right throughout the rest of the economy, or reductions so meagre as to make no difference. So the new legislative framework has to lock in a better trajectory, a better path for the second half of this journey. So that framework will be multi-year carbon budgets, retaining annual reporting and accountability. Fine, I think that, that framework seen in isolation can be an improvement. There's still going to be room for improvement within it, I think, uh, whether that's in independent scrutiny, a degree of politically independent scrutiny to ensure uh, that future climate change plans are adequately funded. At the moment, that scrutiny is, is political or is with internal within government, and there's a, a role for independent scrutiny there. There's going to need a need to ensure pace, uh, because if we're only seeing a, a new CCP coming forward at the tail end of this parliamentary session, there's a danger that we've gone through this entire session with a recognition that we're years behind where we should be and a lack of acceleration that's necessary. So we need to see pace on current action even before we get to a new CCP. I think there's a case for debating a sectoral approach uh, to, target, to, uh, to carbon budgets. Uh, I think there's certainly a case for stronger duties on the government if budgets are breached or look to be off track. And I'm sure these and more issues will be debated when we get to the amendment stage. But the legislative framework in itself, that's not enough. What's required is political will and urgency. And that's the debate we should be having, not just how to get the government out of a legal hole. We all understand uh, why the government is in that legal hole and, and why change is necessary. We need to be debating how we got into that hole uh, and how uh, we're going to achieve acceleration of action now and into the future. This bill could have been combined with policy substance. We know that legislation is required on heat in buildings. We know that legislation is going to be required on transport and on much more if we're going to achieve uh, the, the transformational changes on policy that are required. This bill on the framework could have been combined with that policy substance, and I think that would have given Parliament the opportunity for a much richer debate, uh, and one, I think, uh, which would have answered uh, some of Michael Matheson's challenge to those who will the end but don't will the means. That's been a fundamental uh, part of the problem so far. Green support for this bill can't be taken for granted. Uh, and our, our support, we will ab abstain at stage one, 
uh, and our support for the bill later in the process will be contingent on the action that the Scottish Government is willing uh, to put its weight behind. And government action over recent months uh, in too many areas of policy has been in the wrong direction. So they have a lot of work to do over the short time before we get to stage three. Presiding officer, just this morning, the SEAC committee took evidence on climate justice. Uh, and our witnesses today talked about the danger that Scotland does end up losing the international credibility that it has won on climate. Uh, this bill recognises that Scotland's credibility is weaker than it should be. It could be strengthened, it can still be strengthened, if, for example, the Scottish Government publish before Stage 3 the Energy Strategy and Just Transition Plan and are able then to go to COP29 with a clear position, a presumption against new oil and gas. That kind of step would begin to reclaim yep. the leadership that Scotland aspired to, but which has been put in jeopardy. Thank you. And I call on Monica Lennon. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to take part in the debate and to close on behalf of Scottish Labour. And as one of the members of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee, it sounds like a very popular committee in the, in the chamber today, but I want to associate myself with the, the comments made by the convener and other colleagues, thanking all the clerks, spice uh, witnesses and stakeholders, and the other committees who have also um, participated, but also to thank the Cabinet Secretary and her officials for their constructive and open engagement with MSPs, and I hope that that continues throughout Stage 2 and Stage 3, because today we have heard, I think, very constructive contributions from colleagues right across the Chamber, which tell all of us that the Bill is in reasonably good shape, but there is more work to do. And many of the insights and, uh, I think, questions that we've put down to, to the government today and to each other are informed by the evidence that we've taken at stage one, but also by, uh, from stakeholders who continue to send us briefings and information. So I think it's important that, that government and parliament continues to listen. I think when the convener made his opening remarks um, today, I think Edward Mountain um, you know, sort of set the, the tone and the theme, you know, um, at committee, we were very much in a, in a reflective mood, which is very apt in the Parliament's 25th year. But I think, like those of us on the committee and people in the chamber today, have expressed regret as well that we're in this situation. Um, but I think part of that theme is also about resets. And that's the constructive challenge to, to all of us. Katie Clark talked about collective action. So I'll just offer some reflections on maybe the points of agreement that we've heard um, today. Um, I think Douglas Lumsden was correct to say that parliamentary scrutiny should not be the loser, because we all want to work at, at speed and we need to catch up. We know that, but we need that robust scrutiny. And, and Maurice Golden, um, I think, said a robust reporting regime. And certainly we would agree with that on the Scottish Labour benches. And that's why at stage two and stage three, we will continue, I hope, to work with the Scottish Government on some of the, the recommendations we've made. But I think overall, the 21 recommendations in the committee report are... Are, are really important. And on carbon budgeting, I don't hear a lot of disagreement on that. So again, the, the committee report, um, you know, we settled on the view that you know, a, a framework based on carbon budgeting is, is better and more flexible system for setting targets for emissions reductions in the current approach. And I think what I'm hearing across the chamber is that we all share uh, ambition. None of us want missed targets. None of us want to see missed opportunities. Um, you know, we've heard on the Labour benches and, and elsewhere in the chamber today that we want a just transition because if we don't get that, it puts jobs at risk. It puts our communities at risk. Um, and again, Maurice Golden rightly said we can't afford more, more, more failure. Um, we. Um, also talked about, you know, I think people have given some examples today about some of the policies where people do feel frustrated. So I think Scottish Labour and, and, and Scottish Greens share that frustration um, around the, the reinstatement of, of peak rail fares. I think it's the wrong decision, but it also sends out the wrong message to the public. So we've heard comments today about taking the public with us, giving people certainty and confidence, but that's not the right, the right message. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, 
what Mark Ruskell was saying now, you know, we have to absolutely root this in the science. I think you know, Parliament's always you know, tried to, to, to do that. So where we need to have debate is, is then on the detailed policy measures that we need to take. That's what has been missing. It's that detailed policy pathway. Scottish Labour is fully committed to working with the government and others on this. But you know, we need to get into the, the detail of, of some of the policies that are required. I think it was good to hear from colleagues who have been here a bit longer than I have, like Liam MacArthur. And thank you, Liam, for reminding us of the, the massive contribution that Claudia Beamish made when she was in, 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 in Parliament. Because you know, th that, that, that level, that, that exchange that we heard, I think, from, from Liam MacArthur and, and Mark Ruskell about you know, what the right target should have been. Let's get into that detailed discussion and let's have that passion when we talk about policy and action, because we have a policy vacuum right now and, and that's really not uh, going to get us very far. I think Jackie Dunbar was talking about you know, when we're in Parliament, things can be exciting or important, I think, in terms of getting to net zero is exciting and important, it's essential. So hopefully this is something that's going to really bind us all together. What I wanted to, to ask Michael Matheson, um, I don't think he saw me when I intervened, but I'm really interested to hear how we knock down the barriers, because Sarah Boyack and others talked about we need to work cross-government um, and that's wider society, that's local government too. But there's obviously barriers there. And I know that when Michael Matheson was in the, the role of, of Net Zero Cabinet Secretary, he also had that role of, of you know, across government. So we need to kind of learn these lessons fast. I think I've got a few seconds, but I'll take it. Take the intervention. M Michael Matheson. Uh, apologies, I never noticed you seeking to make an intervention uh, during my contribution. I think the key thing here is that with much of the, if you like, low-hanging fruit around policy areas has gone. It does mean making difficult decisions around policy options, a bit like things like workplace parking levies. Uh, is road charging an issue that has to be introduced? If so, there's a UK aspect to that, alongside uh, 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 road tax. These are the areas that we'll have to get into. And the question is, is there scope to have the right type of debate to allow that to happen in a way that informs how we meet our climate change targets, rather than taking a reactive political position to it? In conclusion, Monica Lennon. Well, in conclusion, we need to get the right national policies and we also need to empower local decision making. So some policies will work in some local authorities and not so well in others. I think that message though about action was really important. And just in conclusion, we heard in committee from Mike Robinson and his capacity as chair of Stop Climate Chaos Scotland. And he reminded us the reason why targets were unachievable is there's not been enough action. We've had the declaration of a climate emergency but not a lot else. It's been a failure of action, not a failure of ambition. That's led us to where we are now. So we need to bear that in mind. But we're here to help with the action required. And the Cabinet Secretary has our word on that. Thank you. And I call on Graham Simpson. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you uh, very much. Um, can I start by um, also thanking the uh, committee for its, for its work on this? Um, I'm not a member of the committee, but I'm a regular attendee um, and as, as a, a member of the Scottish Conservatives team climate which you're looking at um, that will continue now in commenting uh, on this there'll be parts of what I say that are directly lifted from the committee's excellent report and I'll take uh, the intervention Monica Lennon yeah, I'll try and be as brief as I can to say you know, it's, it's great when colleagues such as Graeme Simpson come to the committee because it shows the interest across the parliament so I hope you continue to, to come to committee but Graeme Simpson um, regularly raises the issue of, of bus and the fact that we've got many communities that hardly have a bus to speak of so does he agree that is an action where we need to see more policy, more action, more investment that should unite the parliament Graeme Simpson um, well, that, uh, that was a lengthy but uh, welcome intervention, and Monica Lennon knows the answer, and she knows I agree with her. Um, at the heart of this is the Scottish Government's failure to meet legally binding climate change targets and to produce a draft climate change plan by the end of November, despite promising to have it ready a year ago. And Patrick Harvey was absolutely right uh, when he mentioned that. This, I think, sets a worrying precedent where if a government finds itself in a tight spot of being unable to abide by the law, it just changes the law. 
and even worse, expects Parliament to go along with it and to act at a speed that it, Parliament, would not wish to do and without the level of robust scrutiny that we would normally wish. Now, as the committee said in its report, quote, effective parliamentary scrutiny of targets and plans is a crucial component of overall net zero delivery and should not suffer due to the timing of this bill's introduction or the Scottish Government's understandable wish to re-establish momentum. Yep. And I agree with that. Yep. And it's worth setting out, as others have, the legislative uh, landscape that has got us to where we are today. First, we have the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009. And that established the legal framework for setting and reporting on progress towards meeting our emissions reduction targets. That was amended by the Climate Change Emissions Reduction Targets Scotland Act 2019. Yeah. Now there was a lot of excitement that year yeah. about the climate emergency. That was the year that Nicola Sturgeon declared there was one, so it must have been true. Well. She said at the time that, quote, Scotland will live up to our responsibility to tackle it. No doubt the international confidence in the former First Minister's messianic abilities to deliver is what had as yet unnamed world leaders <laughs> queuing up for advice on how to do so. Perhaps not surprisingly, the 2019 Act imposed some pretty tough targets. The interim target of at least 75% reduction by 2030, the interim target of at least 90% reduction by 2040, and a final target uh, of net zero emissions by 2045. Now, we're not going to hit the first target. That's not so surprising, mm -hmm. given that the Scottish Government doesn't seem to have a plan to achieve it, and the Government's not going to meet its legal requirement to lay a draft climate change plan by November the 22nd. Yeah. Now, the CCC, the independent advisor to governments in the UK on climate change policy, had been due to produce its annual Scotland Progress report in December 2023. Yep. In the absence of a climate change plan, this was postponed. Yep. The CCC eventually published its report in March this year, and among its conclusions were Scotland missed its 2021 annual legal target. This is the eighth target in the past 12 years that has been missed. The acceleration required in emissions reduction to meet the 2030 target is now beyond what is credible, they said, and they went on. Scotland is therefore lacking a comprehensive strategy that outlines the actions and policies required to achieve the 2030 target. This was followed. Um, I'll take the intermediate. Uh, do I have time, presiding officer? I, I don't, don't really, really have any extra time. I'm sorry, Mr you Doris, don't. I'll have to leave that. Um, this was followed by the Scottish Government announcing on the 18th of April that there will be a new legislative approach to setting emissions reduction targets in the statement and in further public communications over the following weeks. Other details were confirmed. Mm. The 2030 target would be removed. The current system of a net zero target, supported by key interim targets and annual targets, yeah. would be replaced by a system of five yearly carbon budgets and the ultimate target of achieving net zero in emissions in 2045 would be retained. Now, it's not so, the, the Cabinet Secretary in her 18th of April announcement said this new legislation would be, quote, expedited. This was to avoid running into the legal duty to produce by this November that draft climate change plan. Now, it's not surprising against all this that my good friends in the Scottish Green Party yeah. have been somewhat miffed by the lack of progress, and I don't blame them. But we are where we are. We have a rather unfortunate bill in front of us, and we must decide what to do about it with very little time. The bill does not specify how soon after receiving advice from the CCC the Scottish Government must lay regulations, setting carbon budgets, this contrasts with the UK Climate Change Act um, of 2008. I think this must be addressed at stage two. Yeah. And the acting Cabinet Secretary said she was considering an amendment to set a timescale uh, between receipt of that advice and laying regulations. 
Um, we will be doing likewise, so I think we should work together on that. Yep. Another issue is that of possibly aligning with UK carbon budgets. We've heard about that already. Um, I think it makes sense. There clearly wasn't agreement uh, in committee, uh, but I think that should be ex explored at stage two. Mm -hmm. Presiding officer, we can agree to the general principles of the bill, but there are still improvements that should be made. I look forward to stage two and then stage three a week later, oh. a bit longer than the government was arguing for, but a happy victory for Parliament. Yay. Thank you. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary to wind up the debate. If you can take us to 5.30, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I just want to thank all colleagues across the chamber for a debate that um, has been very interesting to listen to, but it's also been, I, I think, very consensual, actually. And I think that, that, that we're in a... Um, you know, we're in a position where this is an unfortunate situation where we have missed targets, but can I just say that one thing that does set us apart from some other administrations throughout the world is that there is not one party, and I hope it remains the case, there's not one party in this Parliament that doesn't agree that we have to do something to get us to net zero by 2045. We are very, very lucky in that respect because climate change denial is something that is very real in other, in other parts of the world. So I thank you all for that. So uh, it, with, with that in mind, I want to say this is the, the springboard for um, the next 20 years. This is effectively going to set the way in which we challenge ourselves to meet, meet targets across consecutive um, envelopes of five years across the next 20 years, and uh, under which we, uh, onto which we pin the climate change plans associated with that that is going to get us to, to net zero by 2045. And I want to say that this is also has to, is the springboard to more progress and action. And I will work with anyone, anyone who comes to me with a credible suggestion on the things that we can be putting in the climate change plan, which they think will deliver on emissions reduction in a fair, costed, and uh, a fair and costed way that we can consider. Because. I, I think I've, yesterday I was called a little bit naive by wanting to take the politics out of the, the discussion on climate change. I was told I was, I was being a bit naive in that respect, but I'm still hopeful. I'm still hopeful that we can actually look at this as an existential threat that we are facing. As, as Michael Matheson said, the twin crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss is an existential threat. And if we don't take the politics out of this and we don't actually get our heads together and think, OK, we're going to have to make some really serious decisions on what we prioritise, what we prioritise with our spend, what we prioritise with our action and the conversations that we have with our constituents who are not convinced that net zero is something that is worth doing. And Sarah Boyack rightly made the, 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 the points repeatedly that it can look like it's something very challenging and difficult and negative to people, but it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to maybe bring people out of poverty and, and, and reduce inequality. It's an opportunity to make structural changes to the fabric of society, which will actually give us all better lives, and we've got to make those decisions on how we do that. I'll take Morris Golden. Morris Golden. Just a, a, another suggestion. I've got concerns around the electric vehicle charging rollout whereby if you've got a driveway and you can get a charger and sign up to a tariff, you're paying seven pence a kilowatt hour. Often, particularly with private operators of chargers, you're paying 10 times that. And if you're in a flat or don't have a driveway, you're actually paying more. And I think it'd be really useful to ensure that there's some regulation in that space. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I'm in agreement, and I'm noticing that Fiona Hislop is, is, is nodding along at that as well. As somebody who has an electric vehicle, I have my own charger, but if I was in a flat in, in, in Edinburgh, I wouldn't have access to that, and I'd be paying more because I'd have to go to a public charger, and, and Fiona Hislop is nodding as you, as you were making that point. Um, I want to thank the committee clerks again, and, and the committee themselves. I mean, I, 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 Mr Mountain has been, you know, uh, growling at me occasionally about you know, this expedited timescale, but I really do appreciate what he He's done and what the clerks have done to, to, to get it to stage one, uh, one at this point. Um, the, the, the timing of the, the climate change plan has been something that has been mentioned quite a lot. I sent a letter to the committee outlining that if I got the advice from the Clim committee on climate change by the end of March, that I could deliver a climate change plan in draft. 
before summer recess. Um, I'm happy to, and obviously I'm, I'm, I'm looking with my officials about how we might work on an amendment which actually specifies a timescale. As soon as that advice is given, how many weeks it would be until we bring forward secondary legislation. I'll, I'll take Monica Lennon. Monica Lennon. To the Cabinet Secretary, we've had this discussion in the committee, um, but has she given further consideration to being as open as possible with, with Parliament about the work that's been done in the Climate Change Plan so that we don't have to wait until the CCC advice? Cabinet Secretary. The more this is talked about, the more convinced I am that me and my officials have to be, have an open book approach as much as possible. Now, what I said to Monica Allen in, in the committee was I'm not going to put forward a draft of a draft. Uh, I think that would be something that I don't like to see something unfinished going out there. But I think that what, in the spirit of what I was talking about, about trying to take the politics out of it, I think in order for all of us to make decisions about whether, you know, whatever the CCC's advice is and targets, that we all have a almost a, a big map of all the potential options and all the sectors that could be taken to get us there. And we have an adult, grown-up conversation about what that means for the people of Scotland and what that means for budgets and what that means for, 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 for us as a parliament. And if you are signing up to the targets, you have signed up looking at that suite of options and knowing what could be in the climate change plan. I'll take Sarah Boyack. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking intervention. The principle of having a statement in Parliament I mentioned, you could get the uh, Climate Change Committee report and before you've signed off every single policy action, we could at least have a debate, uh, sorry, have a statement from you about the direction how the government might respond and you could generate support across the chamber. Always through the I'm chair. completely open Cabinet to that. Secretary. I, I'm, 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 comple I'm completely open to that. I think that transparency is where we've got to be honest discussion about what the choices that, are, that we face in front of us. And it's not a choice that's just for the government, it's a choice for the parliament. Because, they, I've just, as I, I've just said, we're, we're today in the first stage of the, a bill that's going to be for 20 years' worth of, of carbon budgets. There will be many people stood where I am with net zero in their title over that 20 years. Um, I want to, uh, the cost and benefit of propo uh, proposal is something that Sarah Boyack mentioned as well. I think that we have to have the costs associated with certain actions as well. I've made the point, and many people have made the point, including Bob Doris today, that you know, government money is not going to do it by itself. It has to be government money that's leveraging in private investment. It has to be decisions that are made by, you know, as, as Morris Stone said, the people that we procure from. You know, we need to be, uh, have a lot more in place to make sure that that supply chain going right back as far as possible are acting in the way. And it has to be something, I think, that you know, consumers out there, people out there, are asking of everyone that they interact with in terms of what they buy and the services that they get. What is the associated emissions uh, around that? What are they doing dr to drive down their emissions as well? Alignment with the UK has been mentioned by, by a few people. Um, we've set out, the, we have pros and cons as to uh, aligning with the UK, and I don't think there's any kind of like settled, definitive, kind of like advantageous list of aligning with the UK. I'm still of the mind that I want a five-year carbon budget starting from 2025 so that we have consecutive five-year carbon budgets right up to 2045. We don't have a two-year one and a three-year one, or a seven-year one and a five-year one, and then ending with a three-year one. If you I could think conclude, was, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I had so much more to say, but I've taken quite a lot of interventions. Um, as I just want to end where I started, I will work with anyone once we have this bill passed to, uh, on the climate change plan, and I... Uh, I thank everyone for their contributions today and I hope that everyone votes for it at stage one. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Climate Change Emissions Reduction Target Scotland Bill at stage one. It's time to move on to the next item of business and there's one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion 14836 in the name of Gillian Martin on Climate Change Emissions Reduction target Scotland Bill at stage one be agreed. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed, therefore, we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.